सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्त सह वीरवाह तेजस्वीतमस्तुम विद्विषावह ओ शाशा Whose question is this? Explain the ro- no, not this one. What was that? Yeah, this one. How did Swami Ji Dayananda started in Rishikesh after leaving Chinmaya Mission? Whose whose question is it? Maybe we should answer it. Huh? Is it present right now? Okay. This one is nice. We'll start with this one. Hopefully, that person will come later. How do we balance having? an attitude of saying yes to the jagat and not becoming a carpet a persian carpet <laughs> my addition <laughs> for other people to walk on <laughs> nice question where does this question come from in the morning we talked about that morning we talked about this that we talked about the need for saying yes of course everything has a caveat and everything is complicated perhaps because it is kali yuga let's blame it on that <laughs> what if you were forced to say yes all the time what if you were not allowed to form boundaries what if you were a nice carpet from birth you you can't become a carpet now if you were a carpet from birth that will continue <laughs> Ah. suddenly becoming a carpet persian or otherwise is not possible so this is a important issue generally what happens in a in an individual's life there is a there is a healthy individuation this one carl jung's term individuation meaning meaning becoming whatever one self is not satchidananda atma and discovering that no individuation means on the level of swabhava not swarupa on the level of the personality even for vedanta to give something up you should have something to give up right there should be something there to give up but if your ragadveshas or other people's ragadveshas borrowed from other people and there is some amorphous boundaries and because of certain problems control issues on part of the primary scare givers <laughs> because of all these things the child sometimes is not able to individuate not able to develop its personality not able to go through the terrible twos and rebel even that takes courage the child has to walk on eggshells <laughs> ooh 
Maybe I should be extra cute to make the mother smile because she's always sad. And maybe I should never be seen so that the father is not angry. Child is walking on eggshells. And the... We discuss the four kinds of habitual responses. Do you remember what they were? Fight. Fright. Freeze. Freeze. Yeah. Not flee. Freeze. Yeah. <laughs> Flight. Fright. Freeze. And what was the last one? Fight. Counted. Flight. Fight. Freeze. What's the last one? That's the one we need. That is the one we need, honestly. Fawn. Mm. Fawn, fawn. Fawn. Fawn means try to please. The baby becomes a people pleaser. Why? For its own safety. It has to. Surrounded as it is by these kinds of people, it has to become a people pleaser. It has to, that's its only protection. If it, if it leaves, then it will be caught and brought back. If it's frightened, nobody cares. If it fights, it will be, it will be beaten up. So it chooses the safest response in the situation, being very amenable. Can you do this, 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 this and that? Sure. <laughs> yes, see this fawning and the fawn response and saying yes to, uh, to life kind of are similar but with a difference. One is patterned, the other one which we talked about this morning is free. So the patterned response is, is because one is afraid. It's a fear-based response. Let me be amenable, let me not rock the ship, the boat, whatever it is, the raft. Let me be, let me just not make a lot of noise and let me never disagree because it is hazardous to health to disagree. And then that's the, as a child, one somehow makes these decisions without really making them. It becomes a pattern that one resorts to. And as an adult, what happens? One takes on much, 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 much more than what one can do. One is constantly exhausted and then angry, not with the world, but with oneself. Why do I keep doing this? What's wrong with me? Why do I say yes when I want to say no? <laughs> Why do I do this? And you want to, you want to tell the tongue, say no. <laughs> say no, don't, don't say yes. You're already, you're already overbooked, inundated, you are tired, you are completely out of your league, you, you have too much to do and just, just say no, it's easy. What will happen? Nothing. Nothing will happen. Say no. I thought your place is here. Oh. So, <laughs> Just say no, come on. And you make plans also. The person makes all kinds of plans and says, yes, and I'm going to call this person and just tell them kindly and firmly, this is not going to happen. And the appointed time for the call comes, the call happens, and then it doesn't go as planned, <laughs> to say the least. Why? Because that person is in a crisis. Truth be told, that person is in a permanent crisis. Yeah. Crisis spelled C-R-Y, crying all the time. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> a sister who keeps crying, crisis. <laughs> and then what? And then your prepared speech and the measured tones of how you would say no, all goes down the drain. All goes down, no, no, nothing comes. And then, even though it's that person's, you know, that, and, the, and then the crisis tells you, crisis personified, okay? So the crisis tells you on the phone, <laughs> I'm just so, I just don't know how this happened, and I just tried, and I tried my best, and nothing happens, in, and the other two volunteers also left, and then, uh, can you please do that as well? Already you were planning to say no, two more things are tacked on, and then you sigh and say, yes. <laughs> and then you want to gnash your teeth. You want to throw the phone. You want to jump up and down in despair. Nothing works. This is a pattern. And so, saying yes to life, saying yes to Ishvara, is not a habitual pattern. It is an openness to greet what comes. It is not living a life of servitude to personalities stronger than oneself. And in this life of servitude saying yes as a default mechanism. And so therefore that uh, discrimination, that viveka must be there. You can't say a blanket yes to everything you can, and neither can you say a blanket no to everything. On the empirical reality, on the empirical level, each thing must be uh, looked at, especially if there is this tendency on a case-by-case -case basis. And sometimes it helps to say yes inside and no outside. <laughs> that also helps. And, when, and then the third thing that really helps is to not say anything at all for 24 hours. Put a lock on the mouth, yes. Uh, or a zip <laughs> on the mouth. Tie up the tongue in knots and then don't say anything. Put, give yourself a, what is that all, a gag order. Yeah, write yourself a gag order for 24 hours and give yourself the time to think, does this remind me of my past? Will I become a carpet if I do this? Or a foot rug, a doormat? Will I become all of these things? Give yourself the time. You see, we live in a, uh, what is that? Information overload world. Too much information all the time. And in this information overload, there is the pressure to respond quickly. There is such a thing called netiquette. Internet and social media etiquette. <laughs> it's called netiquette. And netiquette says, if somebody sends you an email, you should respond within 24 hours. That is the accepted uh, netiquette. Beyond that, no, you're being a little rude. Texts. What about texts? Right away. Ah. Within four hours, not 24 hours, within four hours. I mean, you get a little pass for four hours because you may be driving somewhere, you may be going somewhere, you may be um, in, in out of communication because you are on a plane. So four hours are forgiven, four to six hours. But in that, um, beyond six hours, it's, it's totally rude because they know you have received it. And if they know you have received it, then you can't just sit quietly like this. So all these expectations make one just uh, mm, respond quicker than one is ready. Just take the time, break a few netiquettes, it's okay. 
They say, I'm not going to do this. It's closed? Oh, okay. Transparent, but you know, that has nothing to do with this. Oh, there's nothing there at the top. Ah, I see, okay. <laughs> so, we don't take the time to deliberate. See, when we used to talk to Pooja Swamiji, we would ask him a question and he would be silent and then silent and then silent and then again silent and after what seemed like a, a yuga then he would <laughs> to the person asking the question <laughs> when the whole yuga has elapsed and then he would slowly just talk. And the answer that would come was so deep, so precise and so tailored to the questioner. There is a chair here also. Yeah. There is a chair here. Come. There is a chair here. Yeah. So when the answer came from Pujya Swamiji's mouth, it would just be tailor-made. You did not even need to go for a fitting. It fitted you perfectly. It was all stitched and nice and it was just custom-made for the questioner. And that's because he did not have this feeling, oh, I have to respond. What will they think? Oh my God, I have stayed silent for six and a half minutes. What will happen now? <laughs> that pressure is not there. That is something to emulate. Sometimes even while teaching the class, he would just fall silent. He would just be quiet. First people would look at each other and then after that everybody would be quiet also. And that, that is coming from a certain inner tranquility. A tranquility that is the result of not needing validation from all and sundry. Approve me, approve of how I am. Approve of how I talk, approve of how I don't talk. All these things are not there in which mind that is what is, you know, it's what is that? It's a, it's a mind that is called in Sanskritam as bhadra, auspicious, full. And that is something to develop, that is something to cultivate. Because it's not just becoming a carpet, so many other things. You can become a wall hanging also, <laughs> and wallflower, okay? So, for in all these situations where the personality gets ahead of the person, the person wants to say no and the personality has already gone and signed a contract, okay? Whole life of yes, <laughs> servitude. Sometimes one has to save oneself from oneself, which is why the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita says, Uddhare atmanatmanam natmanam avasadayet atmaivahi atmano bandhuhu atmaivaripuhu atmanaha. Seven times the word atma is used in one, uh, one verse, seven times. Here atma is not sat chit ananda. Atma here is the mind, the personality, the, 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 the one who is endowed with the body-mind-sense complex. This is what it is. I was wondering who is going to sing in between the questions. 
Bhagavan provides. <laughs> so, then the, it says, learn to be your best advocate because if you don't do that, you will end up becoming your worst enemy. That is the gist of this. Learn to be your bestest advocate. You be the best advocate. Learn to pull yourself up when the chips are down. Learn to do that. And that's those two verses there, that one and the one that follows, are just a very uh, beautiful treatise on uh, uh, accountability, individual responsibility. How to not feel victimized? Because this carpet business leaves one feeling victimized. Everybody is walking over me. Where else will they walk? Everybody wants to walk on a carpet. <laughs> Here you are lying down and then so they will mistake you for a carpet. Naturally. Therefore, the, the taking the time to deliberate Taking the time and, and in the worst case scenario you can say, I, I will get back to you. Number four, this is the last option. The last option is you say yes when you want to say no. And then what? Go back and say, I made a mistake. <laughs> Few times when you do that, when you cancel and when you, you know, when you acknowledge, be very free and say, I have this problem, I overcome it. And, and the person will say, not my problem. Yes, that's why I'm saying it's my problem, it's not your problem. <laughs> I overcome it. And unfortunately, I appear to have done that now. And so therefore, I would like to back out. And I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Oh, who can I get and what, oh, how, how, why you only did this to me? All other people you are not doing. Give them a hug and say, because you're so safe. Somewhere I have to practice. And you are so safe, you are friendly. <laughs> and because of that, it's easy to do it with you. Thank you for helping me with my self-growth. <laughs> Disarm them, charm them. Yeah. And if they take something to throw, duck, run away. <laughs> so that fond response is, is, is problematic. All of them are problematic. Each one leads to a different uh, set of problems. But this one is m problematic also. Each one is problematic. That was fun. Can you explain the role of sattva, rajas and tamas in relation to avidya? Gunas. These are called gunas, attributes. Question is attributes of what? Attributes of everything that is woven into the jagat. The gunas are knitted into the jagat. In fact, the wool that is the jagat comes in three colors, sattva, rajas and tamas. Everything is knitted into the pattern. Cannot escape from this as long as one is identified with the body, with the mind, with the senses. Because the body is subject to the gunas. What else is subject to the gunas? The mind is subject to the gunas. The senses are subject to the gunas. And the whole drishya varga, the seen world, the objectified world 
of sight, sounds, everything is subject to the gunas. It's part of you know, Maya's palette. She has three colors, sattva, rajas, tamas. And she's painting a beautiful picture. Sunset. Oh, <laughs> she's a landscape artist. Yes. <laughs> and sunset. Houses, trees, forests, fish, wildlife. Oh, wait, that looks like me. Yes. <laughs> Your body, all bodies. Your mind, every other mind, your senses, everybody's senses comes under this. Trigunatmika Maya. She who is of three attributes, three colorations, this is Maya. And these three gunas, they give a certain kind of a uniformity that ties the skeins of a jagat that is so variegated, full of colors, full of so many different kinds of things. But there is a common thread. In fact, there are three common strands, which is sattva, rajas, tamas. You can look at everything and say that. Food, there are sattvic foods. What are sattvic foods? Don't say milk, because that used to be the case. Not now with all the dairy farm abuses and everything. Yes, fruits you can say, sattvic. And then rajasik. Yeah, what kind of peppers? Chilli peppers, yes. There is one... Uh, Mirchi, there is one pepper called ghost pepper. <laughs> and it is called like that because it's so tiny and it, you don't feel it when you eat it. After you have swallowed it, there is a hole in the <laughs> ceiling. <laughs> yeah. You become Chandrayaan 4. Yes. <laughs> Go straight to the moon. What an accomplishment for India. So, this is Rajasik. Then finally, what is there? Tamasik. What are some examples of Tamasik? Garlic. Ah, garlic. Yes. Peas pudding hot, peas pudding cold, peas pudding in the pot, nine days old. <laughs> Tamasik. Food you can see. Even colors, certain colors pleasing, combinations I mean. Certain colors after you see you feel like going and lying down. You know, <laughs> you're exhausted. <laughs> And certain colors, you don't feel like getting up at all. <laughs> so we, we have that with colors, we have that with foods, we have that with houses, and we have that with people as well. That's why it's not all bad, because it's all about balance. When the gunas are in balance, it's not a problem. Even in Ayurveda they say that. When there is an imbalance of that guna, then see like rajas in its balance, it means movement. We need movement. Imbalance, restlessness, anger, tamas, that's all, it's a place of inertia, rest. We need rest. In imbalance, slothfulness, resentment, anything that holds, you know, holds on, grudges, tamas. So like this, everything, even the personality, is painted like that. And of course, since Maya manifests, shows the side of the face to the jiva, which is avidya, the sattva rajas tamas 
are the bars of the avidya cage in which i feel trapped traigunya vishaya vedaha nistraigunyo bhava arjuna nirdvandho nitya satvastah niryoga kshema atmavan arjuna is advised arjuna is told that all these the whole veda veda means the entire uh, jagat because the veda represents the jagat because the veda talks about the jagat how to be what to do through what vidhi and nishedha through injunctions and prohibitions the veda talks about relationships in the jagat the veda talks about all kinds of things so the veda is what traigunya vishaya the first portion of the veda especially which talks about vidhi nishedha is traigunya vishaya is the, sub- the subject matter of the veda is all these three gunas all the time don't fall into that trap arjuna nistrai gunyo bhava get out of these gunas ha 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 easier said than done <laughs> but lord krishna's teaching to be fair is very very comprehensive and complete he doesn't leave you hanging and even if he left you hanging arjuna will immediately ask a question so then we will get the answer one way or the other so how to get out of the gunas some tips are given nirdvandvo bhava the gunas the 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 sattva rajas tamas uh, prosper when i buy into opposites what are opposites sukha dukha the dyads sukha dukha what else shita ushna hot cold sukha dukha like that when i buy into these opposites then the gunas hold on strongly because it's all about being within the bars of the cage called the jagat the dwandvas they are all bars nirdwandvo bhava and then nitya satvastho bhava so you use the gunas to get out of the gunas by leaving rajas and tamas and shifting this side to sattva catch hold of sattva oh but then he said nistrai gunya be free of all three gunas now what happens if i get addicted to sattva how to drop sattva we don't need to drop sattva sattva is close to sat your nature sat chit ananda sattva is close to sattva means shaucham shaucham cleanliness inner and outer a kind of a godliness is sattva saintliness sattva compassion sattva and forgiveness accommodation kshanti is sattva resorting to all this we overcome the other two now what to do with this one this one resolves on its own it gets integrated into that which is satchidananda it's like a person in a pole vault competition what do they do they have this long stick pole and then they run with that and then there is a wire or something up there and then what do they use the pole to vault over that wire and then what they carry the pole with them no, no. <laughs> pole just drops on its own that's the the purpose of the pole the purpose of the pole is to be able to go over same thing the sattva is like that you hold on to it you hold on to it it automatically there's no, nothing to drop it gets integrated into the person that is that is the idea nitya satvastah niryoga kshemo bhava 
Another tip is given how to get out of the gunas. Yoga, gaining what you don't have. Kshema, keeping that which you have gained from other predators, real or perceived. Shoo. <laughs> Shoo, go away. This is mine. Mine. That is Kshema. Yoga is dividing the world into mine and not yet mine. Okay. That is, and then making the not yet mine into mine, that is yoga. Technical terms. Yoga, kshema. When it's used with kshema, this is the meaning. Generally what? Everybody is interested in what? Yoga, kshema. Yoga, kshema. Ping, pong. Ping, pong. <laughs> That's what one is interested in. Nothing else. Yoga Kshema, Yoga Kshema, Yoga Kshema. Here, Nir Yoga Kshemo Bhava. Free, this is a trap. Free yourself of Yoga and Kshema. Totally free yourself. Oh, up till now I was enjoying the sat sang. <laughs> now, this is not nice. Because what is, does this life have to offer except a few choices? And now you are saying give everything up. You want to make everyone into a sannyasi. All these, this is the problem with sannyasis, you know. <laughs> yeah. They won't rest until they paint the whole world in orange. <laughs> few desires we have. Let us do it. What is, what is it to you? All the time you're coming and doing this. Well, let's go. This is what? Second chapter, okay? Let's take a little jump to the middle of the ninth chapter, where again yoga and kshema are talked about. Where? Ananyas chintayanto maam. Ye janaha paryupasate tesham nityabhi uktanam. What? Yoga kshemam vahami aham. This verse is very popular because of Life Insurance Corporation of India, <laughs> which has appropriated without paying royalties to either Lord Krishna or Bhagavad Gita, it has appropriated this, this whole uh, uh, phrase, Yoga Kshemam Vahami Aham. Lord Krishna's job, LIC, Life Insurance Corporation of India has taken on. <laughs> Vahami, I will carry. What? Your yoga, your Kshema, I will carry. This is a promise by the Lord. There are certain verses where the Lord promises certain things in the Bhagavad Gita. They become very important because it is Bhagavan's promise. And here too there is Bhagavan's promise. You are not in charge of your yoga and kshema. That is not why you, I gave you a human life this time. To keep foraging. An animal forages, hunts. Catches, kills, eats. That's appropriate. That is according to the personality, appropriate. You are not meant to forage. You are meant to grow spiritually. You are meant to come out of this conundrum. This is your job. And what are you doing for this? You are just keeping on foraging. What shall I get now? What shall I want now? How will I fulfill that want? What, what if it goes away? I need something. This becomes a life after life after life after life after life long preoccupation. You just give everything to me. What do you give to me? You give me, your yoga and kshema concerns. 
वट आर यू गोइंग टू डू इट टू दैट आई विल कैरी दैम आई विल मेक श्योर दैट योर नीड्स आर मेट यू मे नॉट गेट द राइट कलर ओके या सो दैट यू हैव टू बी ओके विथ यू कैंट से ओ दिस शेड डजेंट लुक गुड ऑन मी वॉट यू सेंट यू नो दैट विल नॉट डू यू हैव टू बी ओके विथ दैट लिटिल बिट ऑफ फ्लेक्सीबिलिटी एंड ऑल दैट इज नीडेड बट वॉट एवर यू वॉन्ट यू गिव इट टू मी लेट मी बी इन चार्ज ऑफ फुलफिलिंग इट एंड वॉट वॉट शुड आई डू एंड हु विल यू डू दिस फॉर I will do this for people who who's who have made it the business of their lives to discover me as non separate from themselves this for such people nitya bhi ukta naam it's not a one time desire an occasional desire always a committed pursuit those who have i will take care of whatever they want and all they have to do is study vedanta really this happens you start said studying vedanta and then whatever you want comes really it comes you are wondering what shall i do how to do this how will this get all right and it does get all right and even if it doesn't get all right it does get all right and so like this this trust you put and that is told in the middle of the ninth chapter and here in this verse about the three gunas what is told is that nir yoga kshemo bhava means let the yoga kshema go it's a burden that you don't have to carry it's bhagavan's job you do what you have to do mind your own business and what is your business self discovery self growth through the study of the shastra that is the only reason why this human life has been given and so you do what you do best and give this to me so this is how to become nir yoga kshema free of yoga kshema pursuits by letting go and giving it over to bhagavan who is the, uh, the the controller of karma phala results of action then the last advice that is given is atma atmavan bhav atmavan doesn't literally mean the one who has atma because everybody has atma atmavan means some initiative confidence together as a person be somebody who is who who is not afraid and in this way you come out of the you you get ready for self knowledge and self knowledge makes you understand that the three gunas are what mithya they arise from and are sustained by this mithya dependent reality they don't have a leg to stand on independently if they are a dependent reality who do they dependent and who do they depend on me that's what you have to understand and so gunas are uh, dependent on me i am not dependent on the gunas then you come out of avidya and you come out of the gunas as well then this question swami ji started how did swami ji start in rishikesh there when swami ji went to rishikesh there was uh, nothing there other than the ganga some stones trees <laughs> lots of snakes yeah and there was a small huts you never had to buy land or anything like that you just go there and say is anything available 
Yes. This Baba Ji had Maha Samadhi. His hat is available. Okay, move in. That's how it was. You didn't have to pay rent. You didn't have to say this land is my land. And then the, the next one is let me put a picket fence. And no such thing. There's just some group of huts. First, there was a waiting list, he told, for those huts. And, and there, was no, uh, there was no place there. But some, one day somebody said, there is one hut there, would you like to go? He said, sure. And he was staying somewhere else in some other ashram, Andhra ashram, I think, for a few couple of months. And then he then had a small little kutiya there. He would stay there. And we know from his anecdotes that next to him was a yoga swami. On one side was his neighbor. Yoga swami means not, it was not his name. That was his occupation. Whole day he did yoga. So when Pujya Swamiji used to get up in the morning and look out, he would be on the headstand. <laughs> and then he would go to, one hour later, he would go to Kailas Ashram to study with Swami Tarānandaji and the neighbor, Sadhu, would be what? In the headstand. Then he would take his bhiksha at a place called, which is still there, at an uh, annakshetra called Kali Kamliwala, and then come back, and the neighbor was still in a headstand. <laughs> this was one side neighbor. The other side neighbor was uh, apparently a very great astrologer. He kept wanting to see, he was very fascinated with Pujya Swamiji and kept wanting to see his hand. And whenever Swamiji approached him, he would hold his hand. <laughs> so that he wouldn't see. So one day, what that man did, he went in the back. <laughs> Saw the hand. Then, of course, Swamiji could not, uh, it would have been so rude to not show. So then finally he showed and uh, he didn't show. That man saw, the, the astrologer Swami saw the hand and said, OMG, you are going abroad. Swamiji said, I have no desire to go abroad. You are wrong. You are a terrible astrologer. <laughs> they were friends. And you know, you just don't even know what you are talking about. I have no desire to go abroad. Why will I go abroad? I have just come here to stay. I won't go abroad at all. And then uh, he said a few other things, all of which have come true, actually. And uh, so the other thing he said, you know, so he said, you are going abroad. And then uh, Swamiji said, I am not going abroad. I don't think this is going to happen. Not only is this going to happen, it's going to happen quite soon. That's what he said. And so like that, then suddenly Swami uh, Chinmayananda fell ill. And Swamiji had to go with very little notice. And the other thing he was told by the astrologer is that if you ever, you know, if this Swami business you get tired of or doesn't work out for you, <laughs> you can become a musician, a top class musician because your hand is like that and everything, a top class artist you will be. And of course he was such a great singer. And... Uh, then one more thing he told, I'm trying to remember what else uh, he told about the music, about going abroad and something about becoming world famous and having a large following or something like that. That not world famous but he said you will be a uh, benefactor for the whole world uh, and something like that. 
And so those were his neighbors. And then we know from an old video that there was a Shivalinga there in a little quadrangle of the huts that were there. And we have a grainy video of young, sprightly Pujya Swamiji going and doing Abhisheka for the Shivalinga and arranging flowers. That's very nice to see. So beautiful. We also know that when he was studying with Swami Ji, he and another student, two students were there, studying the Brahma Sutra. Actually, the other one we should not even count. Because for, the, for him, the Sahana Vavatu Mantra was a lullaby. <laughs> and the, at the end, what is chanted? Purnamadaf Purnamidam was Suprabhatam. <laughs> he woke up at the end, he went to sleep as soon as the mantra was chanted. <laughs> not one day, not two days, not three days, 18 months. 555 Brahma Sutras later. 18 months, every single day, he used to go there and then lean against the wall, promptly go to sleep. Get up at the end, very lot of Shraddha, do Namaskar. <laughs> and then go back. We don't know who is greater, whether it was that person who kept coming to class, or whether, whether it was Swami Tarananda Ji, one of the gurus of Pujya Swamiji, who did, never said a word for the longest time, kept quiet. If he snored, he would tell Swamiji to nudge him a little bit. <laughs> Wake up. But he rarely snored, I heard this, so it was not so much of a problem. Then one day, while getting very animated about talking of some very uh, rare, uh, what is that, you know, commentaries, which were not all there, which had been lost to humanity and discussing some finer points, the Swami finally lost it <laughs> and told this person, the, the sleeping student, ye sone ka baat nahi hai. Sunne ka baat hai. It <laughs> so, this is not a matter for sleeping, this is a matter for listening. And I think at, after that the person stopped coming. And Pujya Swamiji was the only student at that time. Swami Tarananda Ji used to come to, or was in Haridwar in a small place. It's still there, we can go see it. And it is the same site where the uh, seniors home for the Swamis, Swami Dayananda Anugraha Bhavan is, has been constructed on that same land. There, is some la there was some land in front of it. So Swami Tarananda Ji settled there with two of his students. And I remember going there with Pujya Swami Ji and it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to see how Pujya Swami Ji was with his Guru. It was just a beautiful sight. As long as Pujya Swami Ji could sit on the floor, he would sit on the floor. Even if all of us, they told him, here is a chair for you, he would just push that away, sit on the floor. And only after he absolutely could not sit on the floor, he stopped that practice. And when we went there, uh, Swami Tarananda Ji was really fond of sweets. I mean, really. He always had f five or six big boxes, one kilo boxes of sweets stashed under his bed. <laughs> and he had a photographic memory. He would get these sweets, I don't know from where, but they were quite nice and quite rare. And he would, and he knew which dabba was for whom? <laughs> like for just people who came every day, some general sweets. And for rare visitors like Pujya Swamiji, some very nice ones. So he would say to me, 
ಬೇಟ ಏನು ಗೋ ಗೆಟ್ ದ ಗೆಟ್ ದ ಸ್ವೀಟ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ದ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಡಬ್ಬ ಆನ್ ದ ಲೆಫ್ಟ್ ಹಿ ನ್ಯೂ ಎಕ್ಸಾಕ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ವೆನ್ ಯು ಕೆಪ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಯು ಟು ಗೋ ಕೀಪ್ ಇಟ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಕ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಲೈಕ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ವೆರಿ ಆರ್ಡರ್ಲಿ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ವುಡ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸೇ ಯು ನೋ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ವೆರಿ ವೆರಿ ಕೈಂಡ್ ವೆರಿ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ and sometimes for a holiday he would be a car would be sent and he would be brought to the rishikesh ashram and he would be given a room right in front where he would stay and then uh, everybody just loved to be with him and make a fuss of him etc and the other time we would all go to see him a uh, festivals all these things yes but when new min- newly minted sanyasis were there they were uh, they went to him to get blessings and one thing i learned from swami tarananda ji i will never forget he said uh, there was a group of five six sanyasis and he too was like pujya swami ji who quiet silent deliberative and of uh you know he would talk but not much and he one of the sanyasis wanting to fill up the space the new sanyasi said swami ji humne sanyas liya hai we have taken sanyas and come and he said sanyas liya nahi diya jata hai sanyas is not taken it is given it made a big impression on me it was just so wonderful so it's not taken who are you to take it <laughs> the guru gives it once the guru is convinced that you are ready you are ready for this lifestyle and if you say i took it then it's there is a fu- funny uh conundrum here here you are supposed to give up everything but you take sanyasa and <laughs> that doesn't quite sit well so it is bestowed it's a privilege that is bestowed and what is this privilege the privilege to study and to be able to if one is uh, ready to share that knowledge that is the privilege and then pujya swami ji was fond of writing and he was writing a something a treatise on the brahma sutras and it was nearly complete and then he thought one day i'll just have a nice cup of tea and the little stove was outside you know where this story is going the little stove was outside the thatched grass hut the dry grass hut what happened the wind suddenly blew the other way and everything inside the hut including the manuscript was totally consumed and then pujya swami ji said that a few other swamis came to stand with him and <laughs> look at the <laughs> look at the burning thing and they didn't you know they it was not much they were like ha huh, interesting see how big the flames are oh interesting <laughs> wonder how long it will take to burn down this <laughs> this was the chit chat <laughs> sadhus are weird i tell you <laughs> this was sadhu chit chat and they said you know then they thought should we put water no, not unless it is catching other uh, uh, other kutiyas are catching then we'll see if it is the only thing burning let it burn it's okay yeah and then pujya swami ji made a sankalpa he took a kind of a vow that uh, he said this means that bhagavan does not want me to write he said i am not going to write but yet there are so many books that's because whatever he talked is being transcribed even now as we speak edited and then published then he used to have classes right in front of the hut so many people used to come and we have photos of some of the 
early people who studied with him, uh, like Swami Prashantananda Ji and everything. There are some photos. And the lady who took care of him, uh, Chandramma. And very few women were there at that time. Chandrama was in big trouble in back home in with her family because she had the habit of just going there wherever he was she would just go to Rishikesh fighting with her family and doing that and one day the father or some some relative of Chandrama Pujya Swamiji told this some uh, some person called one man from the family called uncle or somebody uh, phoned and in those days three minute like you could talk trunk call or something it was called and so uh, Pujya Swamiji was in somebody's house and then so the call came there how come you are taking her to this on this path how uh, don't you know that she is unmarried and she should get married and she should have this and that and how can you do this? Why don't you tell her to go back? And he said, tell her yourself, she's right here. <laughs> After that they stopped bothering. And so like this, so many beautiful incidents. And then he he is responsible for changing so many, uh, what is that? Bhajan schedule in some of the ashrams. And schedule means schedule of songs, what songs to sing, etc. And uh, so this, uh, uh, what, the Andhra ashram apparently had some boring songs, boring bhajans, <laughs> and which were kind of listlessly sung by the people. And he revolutionized that and to this day they follow the, those tunes. I don't remember which songs, but uh, which bhajans, but he revolutionized all that. And then they asked him, would you like to just become an inmate of our ashram? <laughs> and he said, no, thank you, and moved on. And then the even the Gita chant that we do was thanks to him, he learnt it from a principal, a retired principal of a Sanskrit college in Chennai. And that has become now world famous. We can't think of uh, chanting the Gita in any other tune than this. And this is not from his tales of Rishikesh, but from his much younger days, he attended a Gita uh, chanting competition and there were two semi-finalists, one more boy and young Swamiji, young Pujya Swamiji. And then the teacher said, both of you have done so well I don't know who to give the prize to. It's just amazing. Both of you have done so well. I don't know what to do. I'm really in a quandary. And Swamiji whispered, I can also chant the Gita backwards. <laughs> Would you like me to show you? <laughs> no, no, I believe you. Here, <laughs> you are the winner. <laughs> we have a long way to go. And lots of, lots of these, uh, the message of these stories to internalize. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Om Shanti 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 Hari hi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari hi Om